All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part two of Spirituality and Chronic Pain, Finding Meaning in the Misery with Dr. Wesley Buck, registered psychologist. Um, I'd like to uh, begin uh, by uh, summarizing um, what we uh, looked at last week. So we are meaning makers who are writing our life story every day. Spirituality is about meanings of ultimate concern that inform our story. Everyone is spiritual but not necessarily religious. Pain and suffering reveal our spirituality, our spirit, which in turn may be informing the meanings we attach to pain. Uh, our spirituality can help and hinder pain and mood management and that we can modify meanings related to pain. Uh, and then if we can change the plot line of our pain story, we can start a new chapter. So we're going to uh, begin where we left off last time. Uh, Wesley book is going to pick up in just a little bit. Um, and we're going to look at how the meanings of our lives, including the deep meanings of our spirituality, are structured into stories. So what does it mean uh, when someone says, tell me a story? Remember when you were a child, did you love stories? Did you want to have a bedtime story before sleep? Did your book have big pictures? Um, Dr. Book last time mentioned that his wife is a kindergarten teacher and that her students usually can't read when they start kindergarten. So she has them look at picture books and tell a story in words about the picture as if they were actually reading. What's the story you would tell about this picture? What does your interpretation reveal about you? We are meaning makers. If spirituality is about meanings concerning the big questions of our existence, uh, I'm going to suggest that these meanings get spun into stories, sometimes called myths, and that we live in these stories. They provide us with a plot line that helps us to make sense of our lives, birth and death, good and evil, health and illness. These stories contain meanings, values, actions, events, understandings, hopes, and dreams of our lives, whether we are aware of them or not. We cannot live in a story, for we are storied creatures. That is to say, we cannot not live in a story, for we are um, storied creatures. We are walking storybooks. We think in stories. That's just how our brain works. Maybe some of you who are interested in neuroscience have looked up the book that Wes uh, told you about last time, The Storytelling Animal, How Stories Make Us Human by Jonathan Gottschall. The author uses insights from biology, psychology, and neuroscience to understand why we are species addicted to story. Even when our body goes to sleep, our mind stays up all night telling itself stories. He includes some findings from neuroscience about a set of brain circuits, usually brilliant but sometimes buffoonish, that force narrative structure onto the chaos of our lives. So there is neuroscientific theory about why we tend to think in stories. What's his story? I have no idea. So now we're going to consider what our own stories are. We're most interested in your story, including your pain story. And we really appreciate the folks who took time to submit their pain stories, and we'll get to them in a moment. So we're inviting you to think of yourself as a storybook. You're an unfinished book of stories that may or may not go together. You're an autobiography that you're writing every day. We'd even suggest that since the meanings of your spirituality are wrapped up in your story, that perhaps you yourself are a form of living, embodied scripture, a sacred text. Perhaps our sacred scriptures are not paper and ink after all, but flesh and blood, you and me. Regardless, I'm suggesting that the stories of your life to date inform and influence your experience of pain and mood, and vice versa. So here are some questions to ponder about your life story. And we're going to ask you to reflect on some questions now about your life as a story. So get yourself as comfortable as you can and prepare yourself in whatever way is best for you to receive these questions. What kind of story are you writing now? Is it a tragedy, an adventure, a romance, a eulogy, 
a satire, a cartoon? Are there heroes, villains, tricksters, and clowns? Are there epic battles, love scenes, monologues? What is the chapter that you're writing these days? What is the plot line? Where do you think your chapter is going? How would you describe the overall mood or feeling tone to this chapter? Is the chapter that you're writing now influenced by a secret story or stories from your past? Is this relevant to how you manage pain or how you feel now? When you consider the stories of your past, are you more influenced today by some stories more than others? How? Is there any relevance to pain and mood? When you consider the stories of your past, are you more influenced today by some stories than others? Do those stories inspire you, depress you? Are there some stories from your storybook that have been neglected, dismissed, or marginalized in some way? Why? Would any of them be helpful to you now as you manage your pain and mood? How is your experience of chronic pain and suffering influencing the chapter of your life that you're working on now? Are you satisfied with the chapter of your story that you're writing now? So from the stories that we received uh, over the break between the two sessions, we'll just share a few of those. People spoke about or wrote about adjusting on the fly. Animals continue to be a big part of my life, though I've changed from riding horseback and doing barn chores to having a companion dog and budgies. I can't play bassoon, tuba, or flute in the community band anymore, but I go to concerts when I'm able and listen to opera on the stereo. And I hum or whistle. And then on the theme of loss, the loss of my memory, the loss of my art, the loss of pace. There is sadness for these losses, and those are difficult emotions to lay to rest. Others wrote about their reliance on others increasing. My husband has increasingly had to take over the majority of what I used to do at home, as well as work long hours. On the topic of changing identity, the basis of my self-worth gradually changed from what I do to who I am. The loss of my memory due to a brain injury was devastating because so much of who we are is wrapped up in our memories. We received four pain stories, and here are the highlights. There was a perspective shift, recognizing that the way I look at life determines my overall sense of well-being, no matter the trial that may be sent my way, recognizing that I may not have a choice in whether or not I experience pain, but I do have a choice in my response. So much is within my realm to strive to do everything I can to facilitate my healing, but at some point you come face to face with the fact that it is grace that heals and the illusions of control are fictitious. I struggle with coming to terms with responsibility versus surrender. Surrender is not easy because so much of my ide ideology involves taking responsibility. Finally, on the theme of acceptance, I learned that acceptance is not the same as fatalism or giving up. Acceptance is seeing and experiencing, acknowledging what is, not fighting it, not dwelling on it, but having compassion for it, watching it, noticing all its textures, and then letting it go while I bring my attention elsewhere. So we ask whether any of these highlights you identify with. Is your own pain story parallel in any ways to these that were submitted? We're going to look in turn at each of the pain stories now. The, the first pain story we characterize as one of brain injury, chronic neck, and arm pain. The writer's spirituality we would describe as, as contemplative, naturalist, and artist. She wrote, I was in denial for two years about the extent of my injuries as I thought I could visualize radiant health with intention and reality would follow. That didn't happen. She also writes, I have been working with teachers who model. Do what you can with what you have where you are, which is action with acceptance. Um, nature, she says, meditation, breathing, and yoga have helped me become grounded, especially when struggling with frustrations and pain. 
So these are some of the spiritual practices or rituals of her spirituality. I do see that today is what I have, and I do have much goodness in my life. Kind of hint of living in the moment there, isn't it? Sort of a present uh, moment awareness. And she says, in my most challenging times, it helps me when I ask, and what are you learning today? Events in life are intended to bring contemplation, and we all need meaning for the journey we are on. Storyteller number two has chronic pelvic pain, and I would describe her spirituality as Christian Mennonite and a kind of earthy simplicity to her practice. She says, I grew up in a Mennonite church, stopped attending for over 20 years, and recently made contact again. Feels good to be attached to a church, though I'm seldom well enough to attend. Church is more a social contact than a spiritual support, though I do enjoy the excellent singing when I get there. When I was in very bad shape last winter, they organized weekly meals for us, roast chickens, mashed potatoes, homemade pies. She says, I recommend joining a church. <laughs> then she says, my spirituality has to do with looking out the window, growing things in pots, listening to music, walking outside in the dark, and listening to my budgies. These things are vital to managing my pain and mood. I have learned somewhere along the way how to nurture and care for myself instead of just looking after everyone around me. I bet you she has a story to tell about that, right? I find ways of experiencing small pleasures each day. Dark chocolate. My business partner, Elizabeth, would now be drooling. Uh, sitting out in the sun or watching the dog run through the snow. I try to be good to myself. I'd say this is a woman who has moved from something when she was growing up that was more external, extrinsic to her, and it's become very internalized, very intrinsic, very much part of what she's about now, and a deep connection with um, the earth, with nature. Storyteller number three has fibromyalgia, arthritis, and complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I would describe her spirituality as that of a Christian Stoic. Those of you who are interested in theology may know that in the uh, Christian New Testament, there's um, a lot of Stoic influence in some of the letters that you can see, some of the house rules, for instance. Um, and some of the sensitivities about how people are to view their bodies and suffering. So it's not that Christianity and Stoicism can't go together. Um, she says, I had a very difficult childhood. I was born a sensitive child. My parents were not religious at all. But I remember earnestly asking Jesus to come into my heart when I was seven years old. These days, I don't know if I would call myself a Christian, is what she, I misquoted it here. These days, I don't know if I would call myself a Christian, but I would call myself a follower of Christ. Praying and asking to be cured leads nowhere in my experience, though I believe in Christ's message and example and get comfort from the Psalms. I find reading Stoicism to be helpful. Both the message of Christ and the Stoics is that we don't need to have made it in society. I bet you she has a story to tell about that, about, you know, how is she going to feel successful in this life and in this society, and um, uh, especially now with her limitations. How's that going to happen? And she says, well, uh, my spirituality has helped me to know that I don't have to have made it. It's what we make of ourselves inside that is important. The Stoics looked on misfortune as a challenge to prove themselves worthy on how they handled it and were grateful for it. If we are unable to change physically, we can change the way we think and choose 
a, 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 the way we think, and we can choose a way of thinking that enables us to carry on and find some kind of meaning in our lives. So then we go to storyteller number four. She has chronic pain, which she didn't describe in any detail. I would suggest that her spirituality is Jewish-Buddhist. Interesting combination there. So um, I was uh, p particularly fascinated by how this would go together, and it does. Um, so here's... Wes, Wes yes. I just, I'll just interject for one second. There are actually a number of um, people who uh, combine their Jewish and Buddhist uh, beliefs, and they're known as Jubus, actually, for those out there. Huh. Thanks for that. I didn't know that. Well, I thought this... This uh, storyteller, this woman, was uh, very interesting to me how she was clearly synthesizing things here in her um, internal uh, life. So it was uh, very interesting to me. Here's uh, the quotes. My background, going way back to childhood, is a Jewish story, and I remember hearing lots of comments from my father. For instance, if it's God's will, meaning we have no choice in what is inflicted upon us. Comments from my community. We are a people who have suffered through the ages. Fatalistic comments. So what can you do? Meaning, this is our lot. We just have to live with it. And altogether, these meanings taught us to think that I was a recipient of life and what struggles it presented to me. Without any power at all. Just think, she says, of the whining complaints I was conditioned to make. <laughs> um, elsewhere, she says, my story changed through many avenues, and she mentioned some really hard times she went, th she went through, but also it changed through mindfulness, meditation, and the Buddhist teachings I learned, seeing that pain was only one part of the big picture, keeping my mind and my thinking spacious. That's wonderfully Buddhist, yeah creating a bigger container for all that may come and go. For me, it has definitely been a spiritual journey, assigning new meanings to old habits, knowing what matters to me most, loving my family, examining and living by my values, my beliefs, deciding my way of being in the world, and acting upon my responsibility to myself and to my fellow humans. Nicely done. So, I'd like to ask all of you out there, um, you've heard four stories from four of our participants. Thanks uh, to all four of you again. Nicely done. Um, and I want to ask um, some questions that will help all of us um, via reflection, just through the method of reflection. Um, detect spiritual uh, and religious meanings in our lives. You know, there might be some question about there still out there about, well, I don't know whether I'm spiritual, what my spirituality might be. It hasn't really, you know, that's not really something I've thought about a lot. Um, so I'm going to ask you some questions, and these are good for you to uh, think with because they'll lead you to any latent spirituality or obvious spirituality that you're about. So here they are. Is there any meaning to my existence? Is there any meaning to my pain and suffering? Why do I suffer? Why me? What kind of a connection or relationship do I have to my pain? Because we certainly are creatures of attachment, so we attach and make relationships to everything. Does my pain have a nickname? Does my pain have an image? Does everything happen for a reason? Am I being punished? Am I reaping what I've sown? Do I create my own reality? Do I create my own suffering? Did I even ask for this pain and suffering? That is a spirituality that's out there, that I chose this life. I chose the plot line of this life. I chose the suffering of this life, um, and I had my reasons. How do I view my body? Has my body image been affected by pain? 
is my, I'd say, is my spirituality connected tightly with my body and my sense of grounding in myself? Can I find peace in this life despite chronic pain? How do I do that? Do I have a still point? Is How do I get there? Is this my only life? Is there life after death? Do I have hope despite pain? What is my vision for a good life? The good life is something that comes up in philosophy, but it's, it's basically what's a good life, a life of virtue, a, a, a life well lived despite pain? What's my vision for that? That might lead you to a sense of spirituality. I'm just going to pause at this moment. We're coming up to the halfway mark, and I think we're doing very well. Um, and I wanted to just see if there was any comments or questions out there um, before we move along. Over to you, Michael. I'm doing well. I'm just putting it out there um, on the chat. Let's see. Any questions for Wes? Um, also, whether anything in particular in these four pain stories um, were relatable and whether our attendees identified with anything in particular from from these four pain stories. I, I certainly did. They were good. Uh, and uh, all four of them were good writers. I'm thinking, Absolutely. how about novels or something or putting out an autobiography? It was great. Yeah, and we did receive another one uh, that unfortunately we didn't have time to include, but to get five. Uh, oh, great! Oh, the obviously they were given so oh, much yeah. thought. Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions at the moment, so maybe we'll we'll press on. Can you on? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we're about to have a poll. My question to you is. Do events or situations cause your feelings about them? So you see on the slide there, events, situations, a little arrow, lead to feelings, right? Or wrong, or I don't know. I don't know you're going to set up a poll, Michael. But yeah. some situations and feelings. So, for instance, let's just say you're here in Vancouver in traffic, and somebody honks their horn behind you. Immediately you feel anger, right? So events, situations, lead to feelings. Or... Um, someone that uh, you love uh, looks at you kind of funny and immediately you feel defensive, right? So events and situations lead to feelings. Some of you out there I know are going, yeah, he's a clinical rehab psychologist type dude and he's being tricky in some way. You can't trust them people. So I don't know. You may be thinking that, but it's an honest question. Over to you, Michael. Okay, Let's open, uh, let's open the poll and see here whether our attendees believe that events and situations cause their feelings about them. Get your results in. Make sure to press submit after you've made your selection. Just wait another few moments as people consider this and send in their answers. Okay, and as we're winding down the poll here, it looks like uh, about 35% of our attendees um, believe that, yes, events and situations do cause their feelings, uh, whereas 12% um, say, no, uh, my feelings are not caused by, by events and situations, with the rest either not answering or uh, not sure. So we have most people, twice as many, do believe that events and situations cause their feelings about them uh, than do not believe that. Well, All right. So I have to tell you, I was being a tricky psychologist. Because here's what I'm going to suggest to you. I'm going to suggest that whatever the events and situations that are out there, the context in which we live, I would say yes, they definitely do influence our feelings, but they have to go through something called 
our appraisal process. Appraisals mean our interpretation of events, um, how we derive meaning from an event. It has to go through that process um, before we have feelings about it. Now, this is a theory, um, and it may or may not be correct. There's been lots of research on it. Um, there are some that might say, no, uh, actually, I have a feeling first, and my thoughts come later. Um, this is all good for debate. But what I'm going to suggest to you for our purposes today, and you'll see why in a moment, is that events and situations out there that happen go through an appraisal or an interpretive process through which we uh, impose meaning on what's happened and we feel accordingly. All right. And the reason I'm interested in appraisals is because something called pain appraisals. Pain and meaning equals pain appraisals. So what does my pain mean now? So you get up in the morning and you will put your feet over the bed and you notice that you have pain in that same right leg, okay? It's been there every morning for as long as you can remember. But unbeknownst to you, you have an interpretive process going on that is receiving that pain signal, that is processing it and is deriving meaning from it and is saying, um, is this a pain that is firing off and definitely causes me to feel hurt and sore and, uh, and in pain? Or is it a, a pain signal that is telling me I've damaged my leg in some new way and I should get to the doctor? Can you see how the consequences might be different? One might say, you know, the one about hurt might say, well, uh, hi there, pain. Um, here we go again. You know, like, I, good morning. I know who you are. Uh, your yesterday's news, in fact, your several years old worth of news. Um, nothing new here. I'm going to go along with my day and not spend any particular kind of time trying to figure out what I should do next. But if it's something new and a different kind of pain, you might go, hmm, I wonder if I've damaged this further or maybe it's a leg I haven't received any kind of pain in. These pain appraisals make a difference to what you do and how you manage pain. Well, here's another question. What does my pain mean for my life? Now, there's an area of psychology, cognitive therapy, it's called, um, in which this fellow a psychiatrist, actually, um, in Pennsylvania, Aaron Beck, was very interested in how depressed folk thought. And he came up with something called automatic thoughts. And he felt that these automatic thoughts really were the culprits in what were uh, either causing depression or were at the very least maintaining and, um, and perpetuating it. I think Aaron would say that, uh, Aaron Beck would say that, yeah, these are the actual cause. I mean, he would talk about automatic thoughts and about schemas like core belief systems and all of that. One of his um, uh, automatic thoughts or dysfunctional thoughts, they have been called, is all or nothing appraisals or all or nothing think all or nothing thinking, looking at things in absolute black and white categories. So it's kind of like um, you wake up in the morning and you have this pain and you go, my day is screwed. So it's basically black and white. I wake up with pain, it's black. If I wake up with a lot less pain, then it's white. But we all know that um, our lives during the day go through lots of fluctuations and uh, lots of black and white, and hey, there might be some gray in there. And then I go to what does my pain mean according to my spirituality, and um, how do I find that out? So I thought uh, what I would do um, is I would answer that using something called an incident review technique. And then I would go to how do I change the plot line of my pain story? And there I use something called a core beliefs worksheet. These are just two strategies that may or may not be helpful to folk out there. There's many other ways to go. But you've all been interested in, I think, uh, that uh, we live in these stories. And um, 
um, and, and some of these stories have deep spirituality in them, and how can I find out what that spirituality might be? And just a few moments ago, I gave you some questions for reflection. That's one way. But another way is something I call the incident review technique. And then after I've used a, an actual case example, um, then I'm going to show you how I might work uh, with that person to change the plot line of their pain story, which is really going in a bad direction. It's going to turn out to be a tragedy, as you'll see. Okay, so everyone with me? Here we go. So I'm going to talk with you um, about an actual person. And um, I appreciate uh, this uh, gentleman for allowing me to use his life story and pain story in particular to help us today. Um, first of all, this is a middle-aged male who has chronic low back pain for a number of years. He has come from a very physical job, and he was super built as a bodybuilder. Uh, he's now off work on disability insurance, and just as a side note, some of you may know about this, his integrity has been really questioned, and it's really hurt him bad. Uh, some of you may have insurance out there, and maybe you've been surveilled, or well, weird vans parked outside your house or something. Um, well, that happened to him, and um, uh, it really hurt him. It really cut him to the core in the sense of uh, personal integrity. Um, he's got a lot of financial strain. Yeah, like who gets rich on disability, right? Um, facing long-term unemployment, which is not a happy thought for him. This man is asthmatic, which is going to be important, and he's also volatile. And here's the sweet spot. His spirituality is definitely Muslim. So I haven't heard from our Muslim friends, um, so I'm glad that he's volunteered. And uh, by the way, I haven't heard from our First Nation friends. I haven't heard from Sikh friends. haven't heard from Hindu friends. There's a lot of folk out there um, whose spirituality we haven't heard from and I'd love to hear from. His presenting problem, by the way, is not a small one. It's He's suicidal. His, he goes into a rage that scares his family. Uh, he goes into a panic, which now there's the connection with, with uh, asthma, um, that leads to frequent um, emergency visits to ER, right? And um, what I've done uh, is I've gone over with him an incident that occurred just recently in which he's recalling a family outing to a mall when he had a pain flare-up. He had mid, -low, mid to low back and hip pain, um, both sides, with shooting, burning pain down both legs into his feet. And uh, the incident included a mall um, incident which, uh, during which he became quite suicidal. So on we go to what I did with him. So what we did was just I had him uh, recount for me, uh, beginning at the beginning, what the developing situation was. Um, and so he was at home and he was noticing pain. Now, those of you that says, you know what, there's a situation and then there's feelings would say, yep, he was noticing pain and he's frustrated. Simple, right? Of course, pain is inherently frustrating and a pile of other things. But I'm going to suggest to you, with all those that uh, work in cognitive therapy and um, the followers of Aaron Beck, that he had an automatic thought that he was able to identify as, here we go again. I bet you a lot of you out there can relate to that thought. So he's at home, he's noticing pain, and here we go again, and he's frustrated. Now, um, the next part is that he can't drive his family to the mall because of pain. Now, this guy calls himself old school, and he immediately gets angry when he's not able to drive his family um, because he's just not safe on the road, right? He's in too much pain. And he's able to identify an automatic thought that went, I can't even act like a man. He's this old school guy and he thinks, I should be driving the family to the mall. I can't even do that. I can't even act like a man. That's like what a man does. He's angry and can you hear the shame coming in now? Okay, so he gets to the mall, but then he has to sit down really soon because of increasing pain. So he barely gets there, you know, and his family's going, woo, you know, shopping, all that, and he's got to sit down. 
how lame is that? He feels really um, uh, more angry. He feels embarrassed. He feels his chest tightening. He's breathing harder. And we were able to identify an automatic thought, which is, I'm so weak. Now, to an old school guy, wants to be the guy who drives the car, you know, all of that. Uh, weak as a man, not a good thing. And he is uh, reacting to that emotionally by getting more angry, more embarrassed, and his asthma is acting up. He's starting to get tight because of anxiety. Then he notices his daughter not listening to her mom. And he barks at the daughter, and um, his wife, her mom, rescues her. So then he gets really livid, and he starts yelling at his wife. And he feels then shame and self-loathing. And his sh chest pain is shooting up and it's hard to breathe and he's got more pain than ever. And we were able to identify just fleeting automatic thoughts of, I can't even parent. Like, I'm such a loser. Can you see how he's getting filled with thoughts of inadequacy, right? Then he um, gets so mad and is in so much pain uh, and feels so horrible because he's forced to go home and spoil the family outing. So he's already feels like he's blown it by blowing up at his wife and indirectly at his daughter. And now he has to uh, spoil the whole outing and go home. And he feels rage. He's getting like violent feelings. He's guilty, full of shame and self-loathing panic, shortness of breath, more pain. Can you see how this guy's becoming a volcano? And what's he saying to himself? I'm such a weakling. Right. All right. So that's what he's thinking. He gets home. He secludes himself in the bedroom with all of his pain. And there he feels more guilty and he feels super angry at himself, and he's starting to feel really down, really gloomy, really depressed. And what were we able to detect as we replayed that slowly? He was telling himself, I'm horrible. What a useless life. I'm horrible. What a useless life. Well, now he's alone in his bedroom, his family is all walking on eggshells. He's feeling lost. He's feeling lonely. He's starting to feel more depressed and hopeless. And what is he saying in there? A little fleeting. These automatic thoughts are short, potent, like jabs. The, the one is, nobody understands me. And he will often tell himself that, not just in this case. Then he said, who gives a shit? You see where that's going. Life is pointless. Why live? Here we go. So he is going to the bottom here, and he's very much entertaining thoughts of violence against himself. Not his family, himself. Then he remembers being at a recent funeral. And in his despair, he remembers it was really hard for him to go because he was feeling so bad. And um, the family uh, went and got him from the back. It was a lot of people at this funeral. Brought him right up to the front row, and the coffin was right in front of him. And he had this kind of epiphany in which he felt that God, in, in his case Allah, was really with him. And there was another part to that, so that felt comforting. But uh, angels were warning him about his direction. And he felt hope, and he felt determination to change his ways. Now you could say, well, he was at this funeral and he felt hope and determined to change his ways, but I'm going to suggest that there were these automatic thoughts in there. And that last part is about the spirituality. You see how we got there? He noticed pain. That's how we started. We followed the scenario through, and when he hits rock bottom and is thinking of ending his life, 
up pop spirituality. And for some of you out there, you know, it's like Alcoholics Anonymous uh, says, you know, I have to hit rock bottom. Sometimes people don't see or experience or recognize the latent spirituality that is in them until they do hit um, a very dark place. Um, I wish that weren't the case, and it doesn't have to be, but uh, sometimes it is. All right. Now then, I want to get to this next one, which is about changing the plot line. So when we were looking at this incident and other incidents and looking at themes that were deep in him, um, and would come out in little things that he would say, automatic thoughts, and and just statements he'd blurt out sometimes, in, uh, especially when he was experiencing uh, emotion deeply. But that's another time when spirituality may pop out, when we're really feeling some sort of emotionally moving experience. And one old core belief is, my life is pointless. And um, I'll tell you that he learned that quite early. And how much do you believe the old core belief? Uh, about 90%. Okay, so it's, it's pretty strong. His new core belief, when he gets into his spirituality, right, and gets grounded there through various things he does, you know, praying, reading the Quran, and so forth, he, he will believe, I can change with God's help. And so how much does he believe the new core belief? About 50%. Before, it was much weaker because he wasn't attending um, his place of worship and um, wasn't following through on the rituals of the Muslim faith, which involve, as many of you know, um, regular prayers during the day, reading of the Quran, and so forth. So then we talk about evidence that contradicts the old belief and supports the new one. So I've made difficult changes in the past, and man, this guy has, um, from when he was young to now in his life. My wife tells me that she still loves me, so a shout out to her. She has the patience of Job and wants me in her life. So how can it be pointless, right, if there's a woman who loves him and wants him to be well? And then I took my daughter on a date, and she seemed so happy. So he's reminded of that. How can life be futile if that's happening? And he's been increasing without, you know, anybody saying anything, praying now four times a day. He's almost uh, reached where he needs to be, and uh, according to the Muslim faith, and reading the Quran. And here's evidence that supports old belief with um, a bit of a reframe, a twist. Um, so I still have pain. So that would support, you know, oh, here we go, life is pointless. And it limits me, so we're acknowledging that. But this reminds me to thank God for what I can do. So he's now taking those times when he has especially these pain flare-ups, which you're all familiar with out there, and his spirituality helps him to uh, sort of uh, capitalize on that and use it as a marker to be grateful, to thank God for what he, um, what he has and uh, for what he can do in his life. And he will acknowledge, I still feel weak in my body. And, and he does feel weak in his body. And he talks about his muscles have, you know, turned to uh, flesh and, I mean, fat and atrophied and whatever. And he says, I, I do feel weak in my body. So that would, you know, reinforce old beliefs. But I grow stronger in faith. It's a different kind of bodybuilding he's doing now. <laughs> it's building um, sort of spiritual muscles, I suppose you'd say. And he still has negative thoughts. Yeah. Remember um, that incident technique, how he had, we were able to identify these automatic thoughts? He still has them, and they're often quite negative, potent, jabbing, tormenting thoughts. They're just uh, fleeting but potent. And, but then he says, but that's just my pain talking. Now, you notice in all of those three statements, there's a but. That's really important. So we acknowledge we don't deny but his spirituality and other reflections on his life help him to put a but in there that kind of puts a twist on it for good that's hopeful. Well, I'm going to be ending off now with a uh, different view. This one comes from Steve Hayes, who suggests that trying to control pain is a recipe for having more pain and suffering. 
the more we resist pain, he says, the more pain persists. We get all wrapped up in a big pain hairball. And then he says, we avoid life and we miss out on life. Now, why am I bringing Steve Hayes up? Well, instead of control, Hayes is recommending acceptance, mindfulness, present moment awareness. There were a number that were talking about this last time. And then committed action guided by our values. And the reason I put uh, Steve Hayes in here, besides the fact I really like his approach, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, um, it's just there are times when too much thinking hurts my head. I become just muddled in the meanings. I need to give my poor adult brain a break. I need to get, as Steve Hayes would say, out of my, out of my mind. <laughs> you know, we talk about, gee, that person's out of their mind, but he's recommending it. He's saying, get out of your mind, get out of that word machine, get out of that, um, you know, that, all those thoughts you're having that drive you batty, and get into your life. Mindfulness, present moment awareness, meditation really helps. And people have mentioned in the story, storytellers, that they had a teacher. I'd like to introduce to all of you my teacher. Are you ready? Here it comes. My teacher is very patient and is showing me how it's done. And in exchange, requires only uh, belly rubs and regular feeding and watering and a walk. It's all good. So I ask with Steve Hayes, but twist it a bit, get out of your mind and into your story in keeping with our theme. And I ask you, what story are you living in? And chronic pain sure does introduce a hell of a plot twist, doesn't it? So we speak of changing the plot line, editing the chapter. I showed you some ways, uh, uh, one in particular, of doing that. There are others. And how can I say that? I say that you can change your story because you, after all, are the writer. So the last thing I want to do is simply this. Let's put your spirituality that which you've been able to identify thus far as your spirituality to the test regarding markers of good pain self-management. So I ask you, is your spirituality actually helping your pain management? So does your spirituality help you with these things? These are all markers of good pain self-management. Putting your spirituality to the test. Is your spirituality good? for your life with pain. And it'll likely be something like, well, I think most of it is. Maybe some of it's not. I wonder what part's not. I wonder what part is just, um, according to these markers, not really helping me and it's kind of getting in the way. So, you know, I have uh, one patient who um, has a profound belief in karma and he's quite suicidal. And uh, one of the reasons for this, which is very hard to budge, is that he believes that it's karma, and that's what's happened, and that's why he's had an amputation and all this. And um, who's going to change anything there? He's not going to touch it. He's not going to change. He deserves it. That's just an example. But there may be those of you out there who have profound beliefs in karma and may think, you know what? He's got the whole thing wrong. I hope so. But that's the way he's interpreting that particular spiritual belief. We're at an end. Over to you, Michael. Well, Wes, maybe I'll share some of the comments that we've received from uh, some of our attendees here. We had someone thank uh, who, who really related to the uh, example that you share, the case, uh, the case story. Uh, they thank us very much for the example, very powerful case story, 
and that they could relate a lot to the idea of automatic thought. Yeah. I could as well. Um, and, Michael, it's a real life our... story. I'm not making this up. This is a oh, real temporary that. story. Right now, everyone out there is this gentleman. It's a very live situation. By the way, he is doing better, so you can all breathe a sigh of relief. But I'm not making this up. Oh, that's, that's really good to hear. Uh, we also had somebody recommending blogging for telling and sharing one's story. No, oh, that's that, great. Um, huh. Yeah, it's a great idea. Um, and then a comment on this idea of appraisal. Um, someone writes, yes, we do have to do an appraisal, but I think it's all it always will generate some sort of feeling, whether it be to do nothing or to do something. Yeah, um, I, and I sure agree. Um, and you know what? There uh, are some p folk, uh, and I think they have a really good point, who say, you know what? Um, however it happens, we get these feelings, these these deep felt experiences that come bursting out, and they come with thoughts. So, you know, sometimes it's a chicken and the egg. You don't know what came first. Was it the thought? Was it the feeling? In cognitive therapy, it's these automatic thoughts. But maybe you'll say, go back a piece, and there's been this little unconscious feeling that was going on that generated a thought, which generated a more obvious feeling. You can go on and on with this. I'm just getting you to think about pain appraisals and, and how you interpret your pain and what a difference that can make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the truth is that uh, two one-hour sessions just aren't enough time to really uh, delve into the topic um, <laughs> adequately. So what we've really done is we've introduced some ideas, and um, <laughs> and hopefully this will encourage people to explore the role of spirituality in their lives further. Michael, and, thank uh, you much for inviting me to do this and um, I, 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 I've really enjoyed putting this together and I've really enjoyed the uh, participation of people taking the time to participate and come online and, and share their thoughts. Uh, a, a big shout out to the four stories uh, tellers. Um, thank you for your stories and to all of you who read the books. We didn't get to them, did we? Uh, we could have a session or two just on Frankel. <laughs> let alone the other ones. So there you go.